The million dollar question, how do entrepreneurs transition from self-employed to owning a business that turns a profit? My name is Chris Waters and this podcast has the million dollar answer. Welcome to CEO Secrets. Guys, uh, so welcome to CEO Secrets. I'm super excited about the guest we have on today. Uh, this um, We have Howard Tager. He is the CEO of YLopo. For those of you guys that are not familiar with YLopo, it is a a lead generation platform in the real estate industry and uh, way beyond lead generation also helps you with just, you know, staying in front of your database, database remarketing. Um, I personally use YLopo. I'm not getting paid to do this, by the way. <laughs> I'm just a raving, I'm a raving fan of the product and super excited about, the, about what they're working on. Um, and, and on this call, um, I hope to extract from, from Howard kind of what, what uh, the ladder looked like for him to find success as a entrepreneur and CEO and um, hopefully extract some of his guiding principles. And then um, something else really cool I just want to talk about more live is the AI component you guys have integrated with um, Facebook. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, th yeah, this, this could be a, an all-day conversation, lead generation. We, lead we can do three conversations. Yeah. We can do the secrets of CEO success. We could do yeah. lead, you know, <laughs> different flavors of leads. <laughs> we could do AI. We so what? So, <laughs> so Howard, um, you know, uh, there's probably, a, you know, what's crazy is there's probably a lot of people on here that don't know about your history in real estate, but you are somebody that has been in the industry over 10 years focused on serving real estate agents, teams, and brokerages at a really high level. Um, why don't you share with everybody kind of your background, how you got to where you are, and, um, you know, what, what specifically you've done in the real estate industry? Cool. Um, so, um, I, you know, I'll take you right back to just after college, right? Because that's where my, kind of my journey started. And I was kind of going down this like ivory tower uh, path. You know, uh, I was in strategic consulting and, and working like seven days a week. And I just, I just had the epiphany. I had the realization when I was super young, so I was really lucky, right, of what I didn't want to do. Didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do. But I think at that age, it's really important to know yourself, start understanding yourself and what's going to make you happy, what's going to make you unhappy. And I understood that just sort of sitting in an ivory tower, whether it was becoming like a corporate Wall Street attorney, an investment banker, a strategic consultant, I would have been miserable. Like I would have made a lot of money, right, and had a fancy home and the whole thing, but I would have been miserable. I would have been miserable going to work every day because I was miserable going to work every day right out of college, right? So I had this kind of little event where I actually had to have like, it's like almost like a side gig that I had to do for this consulting firm. Something was really, really rare for them where I was pulled off of spreadsheets and PowerPoints and I actually had to run this small little business. I had to hire like hundreds of college kids at UCLA and USC and Santa Monica city college. I had to give them all these laptops and you know, Chris, I'm old enough where laptops back then, were really big. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those? Yeah, you, you're too young. These compact laptops were just huge. It was they were amazing. Anyway, I had to arm all these kids with laptops, and they had to go out and do like thousands of interviews uh, f with with small business owners, right? And I had to create this huge, giant database of of marketing stats, right? It was called conjoint analysis. Anyway, so so the long and short of it is is that I had this realization that for the first time I was happy. And the question is, is why was I happy? So, because, hey, hold on. Let me, let me yeah. interject here. So yeah. just some little nuggets you've dropped is one, have enough emotional awareness to focus on something you enjoy. And you, you, um, you're, I mean, you're, well, I don't know if a lot of people know this. You're a super smart guy. You graduated from Yale, right? You graduated from Yale. And you, are you in law school there? Where'd you get a degree? No, I was, uh, I was undergrad. Um, I actually graduated in the top 1% of my, of my class. Yep. But I say that not to brag. I say that to be humble because I am convinced that I was in the lowest 1% of intelligence and in that class because that class is like, you know, 1,200 geniuses, right? Um, I mean, they regularly rejected valedictorians, right? Um, I think I got in, honestly, because I realized I had sort of what they call contextual or, contextual or street smarts. I realized there was no way I was getting in, right, unless I did something different. And I literally did like a stand-up routine when I had my on-campus interview. And when I walked downstairs, when I walked downstairs after my interview, my dad was like, what happened up there? Because all he heard was this woman just laughing for like an hour. So she remembered me out of like every single person who was a valedictorian and president of their class and head of their newspaper and blah, 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 blah. And everybody kind of all merged. 
I was the one. I was the one kid who just I just did a stand-up routine, made her laugh. Right. Hold so, on. Let me let me ask yeah. you something real quick. So yeah. when you applied to Yale, yep. you had to um you had to apply right, and then yep. there's a, the application process, whatever. But yep. like, did they, did they also interview the students? Is that the next phase? And you trying to get selected, you get interviewed. So um, it wasn't an absolute requirement, but at the time you learned that, you, you know, you had to do something, right? So mm -hmm. to try to get an on-campus interview was a very smart thing to do. Got it. Okay. So this is like an extra extracurricular activity to try to stand out is going and doing an interview. I mean, every, like extra activities were like, everybody was captain of their team and yeah, just I all guess. That stuff, right? Yeah. But it was, it was, it was sort of known that it didn't hurt, right? If you could actually meet someone on the admission staff because they're making the decisions, right? So to actually press the flesh, go to New Haven, meet them. Um, you know, the funniest thing was, it was one of my roommates who, who did the same thing I did, went to New Haven, which is in Connecticut. And the first thing he says is, you know, she's like, welcome to New Haven. He goes, I love New Jersey, but he was in Connecticut. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> he still got in, which is pretty That's crazy. Good. That's good. Okay. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so, so look, I, like I said, I'm convinced that, you know, I work, I work really, really hard. Like I work, so, I work my ass off. So when uh, you, after, yeah. so you were telling this story, so you, you went into the strategic uh, consulting, consulting, various things, miserable. You go and yeah. start this business, basically collecting data, um, interviewing other business owners, getting all these, um, you know, students to help you to collect data. So I was given a budget, right? Like the head partner said, this is how much money you have. And this is the results you have to get. And you have to get it by this date. So mm -hmm. I was given a budget. You have to get X num number of results and you've got to get it by this date. He was like the rest you figure out. <laughs> and I had no blueprint, right? I'm like just out of college. I've got no blueprint. And in a sense, I had to run this little business. But it was just the real world, get your hands on a real world problem that I, I just loved. I had to hire people. I had to figure out a pay structure where I still could make my budget. I had to fire people who weren't performing. Um, I had to figure out how to like geographically, like this is before we had like Waze and Google Maps and all that stuff. I had to get people to all these destinations. So I just had real world, like everybody knows here, running a real world business and the one thing I know is like every single day I brace myself every single day. I brace myself for something like literally today we had something very serious situation. Someone on my executive team has had a major, major health crisis, right? That's my day last week. Um, you know, it was a legal letter, which was completely like specious and wrong and all that stuff. But I had to lose my entire day, deal with it. Right. Put it, put it away. So, so that's the thing you learn when you run, you know, a small business, a medium sized business, a large business, what I call extraordinary items, things that happen out of the norm are actually ordinary, right? Extraordinary expenses happen ordinarily. You know that Chris, right? Yep. So yep. you got to brace yourself for that. And what? anyway, yeah. So I, early on I figured out I wanted to be an entrepreneur and um, you know, I finished out my gig doing the consulting thing. And um, I think one of the most important things I did, which is one of my kind of guiding principles, is I always find business, a business partner or business partners that are really strong in the areas where I'm really weak. So what I would tell everyone is to be, is to always be brutally honest with yourself and write down like assets, right? And liabilities. What are you great at? What's your lane? What are you really the best at? And what, pardon the French, what do you suck at? Yep. Like, what are you horrible at? What do you yep. not like to do, right? And you need to, you, I would never be successful if it was me, myself, and I, ever. I have, I, I've had now, this is my, my third most successful, largest companies, I've taken two companies literally from starting them in my dining room because we couldn't afford both rent for our, for our home and rent for the business. Last two yeah. businesses, I swear to God, I've actually started all three companies in my dining room, proud to say. Hey, what? Um, yeah. not to interrupt, so you, when did you start Tiger Leads? And for people that aren't uh, familiar with Tiger Leads, yeah. um, I mean, you were kind of like the innovator in the real estate industry with Tiger Leads. Like, came up with one of the best platforms before the boom towns and the commission zincs and yeah. all those existed. You were like the first one out there that came up with the most sophisticated 
CRM system for the real estate space. What, what, when did you start Tiger Leads? Yeah, so, so after I finished the consulting thing, I convinced this, this, this guy um, who was also kind of a young recruit with me in the consulting firm. Um, he had gone to Harvard and he was the smartest guy I'd ever met. And he was, he was just so strong, you know, quantitatively, analytically. Um, I was kind of more of the, the, the voice and the sales guy and the you know, emotional driver and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I got to partner with this kid. I've got to partner with this kid and we can do great things. Didn't even know what we were going to do. I just knew like me plus him, we could do something and we could start it with nothing. So with $1,500, Chris, we started a tutoring and test prep company from our living room in Wayne Gretzky's old apartment in Marina Del Rey. Oh my God. And, and that's what we started, right? And I had scored perfectly on the verbal SATs. My partner had scored perfectly on the math SATs. And we literally wrote a program to raise kids' scores on the SATs and ACTs. We could not afford any employees. We like <laughs> answered the phones. I'd go out to the schools and try to talk to college counselors and hustle business. Then we'd come back and then like we'd go off and I'd white line on my, you know, Kawasaki down the 405 freeway to like these really rich <laughs> homes. And I would tutor kids, right? And they were just like, okay, they wanted to Howard Nart tutoring, right? And then we'd come home, pour all of our thoughts, all of our learnings into this curriculum that we developed over time. So we just worked around the clock, which you can do when you're 22 years old, right? Yeah. And long story short, it, you know, it was like a lot. We had this business for a long time. We had this business for like 10 years. Kept leveraging wow. ourselves, leveraging technology, leveraging ourselves. We became the largest test prep and tutoring company west of the Mississippi. And we were acquired by Sylvan Learning Systems way back in like 2000. And then I worked for Sylvan Learning Systems, and that's where I learned about digital marketing, which was the cutting edge, the forefront of performance marketing, right? And one of the smartest, I always try to find like the smartest people. I always try to surround myself with people that I know are smarter than I am, right? And so I found like the one VP at this big public company who was just amazing, like, wow. And he was this digital marketing guy. And I just, I spent so much time with him and learned about digital marketing. And so... Long story short, um, one of the guys that, that we had hired at this company called Ivy West, this test prep company, was a genius programmer. And you know, everyone had kind of gone off in their own directions. He went to work for his brother, who was a broker in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hey, and, um, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm feverishly taking notes here. Okay. So I'm sorry I keep interrupting, but- No worries. Um, I'm, t- I'm telling you the Tiger Lead story. No, 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 I know, I know. But you've said something over and over again which is like, you know, hire really smart people. And not only are you hiring smart people, you're hiring people that are like, you know, savants, right? Exactly. And so for people, for people that are watching this, shoot, even I want to know this, like, how do you get, how do you get someone like that on your team when you're bootstrapping your business? Like you, how do you give, how do you get that person when you just can't afford to pay them some crazy salary? Like as a they startup. Rec- I think, I think that they have to, wholeheartedly recognize what you're going to bring to the table. Okay. So, um, you know, as a good example, when this really amazing program, an amazing engineer came to me, he came to me, he could have gone to anyone, right? But he came to me because he had built this incredible system while, you know, working with his brother in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in this brokerage, he had built this incredible 360 system, which eventually became uh, Tiger Lead. And it was called something else and it was built on a different underlying infrastructure platform with that we rewrote. But he came to me and why did he come to me? I, he came to me because he wanted, he wanted some vision. He wanted some strategic advice some strategic insight. He wanted to know what this could be, right? And so, you know, you do have to be good at what you do and that's kind of the barter, that's the exchange, which is on his own, that no matter how amazing that system was, on his own, he would not have pulled it off. He also needed, you know, it takes the cliche. It takes a village. It does take a village. So, so what did you offer this guy? What kind of money did you give him? Just equity well, partners? Right off the bat, I, you know, he literally said, I want, I just, he just, he didn't even, he didn't overtly come to me and say, Howard, let's launch a, let, let's launch a business, right? He just said, I want to show you this and you tell me what I do with it. Now, obviously I think behind, you know, uh, behind his thinking was, I might like it so much that I might say, let's do it, right? I did a month's worth of due diligence, spoke to everyone in the real estate industry, felt there was a huge need for it. I came back to him and said, my strategic advice is you and I become 50-50 partners. So now there's another lesson here. 
right? And, you know, and look, we knew we were going to bootstrap it. We knew we were not really, um, but I knew that I was not going to take any money out of the company. I was not going to get paid. It, for two years, I did not take a penny out of that company. For two years, right. I did not get paid. He needed to get paid. He needed to put food on the table and pay rent and, and, and all that. I was fortunate enough. I, I didn't, right? So that was part of the partnership as well. But the first thing I did out of the gate was gave away half of the company. So after he and I were like, okay, we'll be 50-50, the first thing I did, and this is a big lesson, is we brought on two more partners and we each became 25% owners. Four people each became 25% owners. In two seconds flat, he and I, and I, I applaud him for this as well, he didn't struggle with it. He was, again, was smart enough to understand we needed two more people who were good in their lane, doing what they do to flush out this management team. And the number one piece of advice I give to young entrepreneurs, I see they're very protective. They're very protective of their idea. They're very protective of their equity, which is, which is also good. And I'll explain that, right? But sometimes they can be so protective that they're just me, myself, and I. They're not bringing in the right people. And, you know, 100% of $10 is $10. Yeah. And 25% of, you know, of 10 million bucks, right? Is two and a half million, right? So that's yeah. the basic philosophy. So that was the first thing we, you know, the first thing we did, we flushed out an ownership team where we literally had no gaps. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I think a lot of people, the reason they're afraid to give up the equity is they're not truly thinking big enough. So they are, you know, like the vision of where they want to go is an, is actually not big enough. And and so the, you know, you almost have to force yourself to think bigger, so that if you do, um, you know, divide up the cap table among multiple owners of a company, you got to make sure the company is, you know, equally growing um, in parallel with the number of people that are it's, adding. It's, it's Chris. It's one of the toughest things, and and I have some sort of like absolute rules. Like we could talk about measurement, accountability, visibility. Measurement, accountability, visibility. One of my guiding principles. I'm very absolute about it. I'm very absolute about a whole bunch of things. The equity thing. It's not an absolute. I have to give advice to people based on different situations because some entrepreneurs make the opposite mistake. Some entrepreneurs, they're, they're, they're like, they're total product. They're into the product. They're geeking out on the tech. They don't think too much. And they're giving out equity all over the place. Mm -hmm. And they literally could sell their business for $200 million, right? I'll never forget when, when my you know, investment banker once told me, he's like, he's like this year, my he's like, my largest transaction was $300 million and my smallest transaction was $30 million. And he's like, guess what? The guy that owned the $30 million business took away more money than the guy that started the $300 million business. Because the guy that started the $300 million business had been diluted so yeah. many times and had given away so much of the store in the beginning, right? Yep. So, so you, look, I really believe in having the right partners. Um, number one, big mistake that people, I see people make is they don't vet their partners from an ethical and moral standpoint. Um, and, and I see this, and I see this a lot in our industry. What's your right? vetting process look like? Right? You said ethically. You've got to dig in. You know, you've got to do research. It's called due diligence, right? You've got what to does do that diligence. look like? What are you doing? What are the things you're looking at? Um, I mean, I'm looking at their past track record. I'm, I'm trying to talk to people that they've worked with before. I'm seeing if they've ever been entangled in lawsuits, right? It's hard, right? But, but, but you know, I was blessed at, you know, with Wailopo. I, my co-founder is G. And you know G really well. And he's, I mean, G is absolutely the smartest kid I've ever worked with. I, I think he's the Elon Musk of our industry. Um, he's totally genius to what he does. He, his, his work ethic is like, it's like having 12 people in one person. It's crazy. But luckily he had come to work for us at Tiger Lead. So we had a long period of time where I could work with him and, and, and in a sense got to vet him and knew someday I'd love to partner with this kid. I mean, What just, about when you don't have that advantage, right? And it's like somebody off the street you know, or some referral. What are you doing to vet them out? I mean, you're talking to people, you're talking to former employers, you're talking to former partners. Um, you're doing a lot of online research. This is, there's, you know, this is, this is the standard stuff that, that you yeah. have to do. Um, I've been fortunate in, in just in my last two companies where I had worked with the prior founders at both Tiger League and mm -hmm. at Ylopo. Mm -hmm. Cool. But, but again, that's very, very important because I see this go off the rails so many times where all of a sudden some partner starts stealing from the company or starts working another gig and in a sense, not 
providing the fiduciary responsibility to his partner and to the business, right? Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of things. That's important. Um, again, the other incredibly important thing is don't repeat yourself, right? You're a great salesperson. Don't go partner with another great salesperson. Yeah. Right. You're the total quant analytic jock. You don't need that. Right. Mm -hmm. Find people who need you and you find people that you need. So after the, so 10, I had no idea about that tutoring business. That's pretty cool. So what, what happened after the, uh, um, after that company? Right. So kind of went, went all, all different ways. Um, and um, then, you know, this, this kid who had worked for me at the tutoring company showed me this system that he had built, this 360 system that he had built, which was digital marketing, was micro home search websites, and then a purpose-built CRM. And it was all in one system, right? And it was incredible. I did the due diligence on it. We launched Tiger Lead. We had hockey stick growth. As you pointed out, there was really nothing like it. And then uh, we just refused to oversell the markets um, because there really was a cap in terms, because we were doing nothing but Google pay-per-click. There really was no social media marketing at the time. Uh, Facebook didn't exist. It didn't have, it didn't have the digital marketing tools. There was nothing you could Tell do. Tell us right? what year, what year was this? When did you guys sell? So we started, we started in 2007. Okay. Um, and we really had hockey stick growth. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, 2008 was the great recession, right? Um, we ended up being acquired by realtor.com in late 2012, but we really built this company during the great recession. And you um, guys, I heard, I think I read an article you sold for like 20, 30 million. It was about 25 ish. Yeah. Cool. But we had no, we had no debt. We had it's pretty no, huge considering had, it's during the worst um, time in the history of real estate. Well, we also had no debt. We had no, and we had no investors. Like we owned the whole wow. company. We, wow. We, we bootstrapped it. We, we wow. built this thing with our, we put money in and two years before we took any money out. That's we, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So things changed, right? You know, when I started my first tutoring company, you didn't have young 25 year olds running around with a PowerPoint, just a PowerPoint and literally raising millions of dollars with no business which is what you have now, yep. right? You know, people go back and they look at, you started your own business with $1,500. Well, that's what we had to do. We didn't have a choice, right? Yeah. Things have changed, right? We're still very, very capital efficient. We only raised about 4 million bucks for Ylopa, which is, as you know, very, very capital efficient. Yep. You and I both know companies in the space who have literally raised 50 to $100 million. Yeah. Still don't have a business, right? It's an insane number. Yeah, insane number. A billion. Uh, by sometime next year, we, we, Wailopa will be twice the size, um, probably by Q2, we will be twice the size um, than, you know, when we sold Tiger League. So, um, and, we're, and we're still at the very, very, very beginning. So before, so I want to move on to talking more about um, Facebook lead generation, lead conversion, lead quality, all that kind of stuff. But before doing that, could, could you like summarize what you would say are the, you know, key bullet points or the guidelines yeah. you live by to be a great CEO, great leader of an organization and, and set yourself up for success to scale a really big business. Yeah. So I actually, I took this very seriously, Chris. Um, so I actually, this morning, um, thought about it while I was working out and then I jotted down some notes, right? So, um, I think it's really cool kind of, you know, what you're doing. Um, so we've already talked about, which is, which is the word leverage. Everyone should write down the word leverage, right? You, you can only build, um, you know, a medium to large size business if you escape the sort of me, myself, and I, right? So you're leveraging the best partners you could possibly find. You're leveraging the best employees that you could possibly work with. And you have to leverage technology. Those are the three things you have to leverage so that you can produce more, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I believe in specialization of tasks. And I bring this up because I know that, um, I think a lot of the audience, is that right, Chris? A lot of the audience are, are sort of running teams. Yep. So I teams. classify I classify teams like the smallest teams or the me myself and I teams like maybe a husband and wife team or two people or three people and they're kind of doing everything. The, the next level is when you've maybe got a team of let's say buyers agents, but I, but that's like a team of generalists where everybody's doing everything. I'm working with buyers. I'm working with sellers. I'm meeting you know the appraiser. I'm talking to the lenders. I'm trying to do ISA work. I'm doing transaction stuff. Like everyone's doing everything. It's they're, and, and they're just running around with chickens like their heads cut off, right? Yep. And then you get to the more sophisticated teams, the larger teams who can't get to that size without then assembling a team of specialists. But I still see medium to large teams that that um, struggle with this. But what this comes down to running a real business, it would be absurd to think about like my business. Would I ever have someone in my finance department working in sales? Would I ever have some, would I ever have a pure salesperson 
working in operations, would ever have someone on my client success team like working in digital market, like everybody's in their functional silo and they're really great. They're great digital marketers. They're great programmers and technologists. They're great product people. They're great salespeople. They're great customer support people. We live in the real world in the age of specialization. You have to. Yet I see so many teams that have people doing too many things. So they're never great and focused on any one thing. And that's a really, really big issue. So, so specialization, take a hard, hard look at yourself and your team. And do you have these generalists running around or do you really have specialized tasks, right? Do you have buyers agents, listing agents, showing agents, ISA people who never leave the office, right? And, and, and that's what I want people to think about. So I, I think to that point, and by the way, anybody watching this on Facebook Live, feel free to uh, comment in the um, comment section. If you have any questions for Howard, uh, fire them away. Um, Howard, I would beg to say like what some people might um, counter argue to your point, which I agree with your point. But when you're when you're in that growing phase of your business and you don't have enough revenue to support those hires, you end up wearing those hats. So it seems like, you know, the key is, though, when you get to a point when you have the revenue, outsource that task as, as quickly as possible and um, don't get greedy. Be willing to sacrifice the income to hire somebody else because that person would help take you to that, you know, that next level. That's five, 10 X above where you would go. Right. You, you know, look, you're absolutely right. And when I say me, myself and I team of generalists, a uh, team of specialists, that is an evolution. It's a progression. So you and I are actually agreeing and saying the same thing. Yeah. You have to evolve and get there. Yeah. But also like, you know, business owners, like, like I'm a serial entrepreneur, right? We take risks. Um, you know, I mean, I personally put it, in a half a million dollars myself into this company at the riskiest stage when we really didn't have revenues, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, sometimes we just have to say like, hey, let's raise some money. Like I have a vision. Let's raise some money. Let's invest in the company, right? And now I can hire the, the specialists. Yep. And that's sort of another thing, which is I find way too many people who are not building pro formas. They're, they don't know the numbers, right? You've got to be a master of the numbers or work with someone who is. You've got to know all the dollars coming in, exactly all the dollars coming out. You've got to know the ROI on every single expenditure you have, whether it's tech, whether it's people, whether it's, I mean, it's everything, right? And you've got to be able to forecast out by minimum, at least 12 months. I like 36 months for me. I always keep a sort of rolling 36 month. And that's as far as you go because, because beyond 36 months, it's just fiction. But I live by, by a budget, right? Um, I'm looking month to month, right? What did I, what did I forecast? What was my budget? What did I actually do? Right. And I'm looking at all the different line items. So, so besides, you know, sort of, you know, know thyself, know thy numbers. It's really, really important. The other concept is I, I've given talks about this, which I say is become a maverick, M-A-V, maverick, which is measurement, accountability, and visibility. And we really walk the walk here. So I don't just preach this to our clients. We really walk the walk here. And I, and, and, and I think that I would say, Chris, that I, like I wasn't great at that, probably in my first business, probably got a little bit better at it, maybe in the second. And I think we're doing really, really well. Matter of fact, I would tell you that in the first early stages of Ylopo, we sucked at it. You know, like our management team meetings, our executive team meetings, if they happened, right? And that was, that's a bad thing, right? Because all of a sudden G would say, oh, no, I got this thing and let's just do it next week. Or I'd call like, yeah, I'm on the road. Let's do it next week. That set a very, very bad signal and precedent to the rest of our management team. But even so, we'd walk into our management team and we'd talk about all the stuff that's going on. But we've evolved over the last few years to a very, very tight meeting where each of the division heads is sharing all of their numbers. So, so the guiding principle is that you need to measure every single KPI or key, um, you know, uh, performance indicator, performance indicator yep. right? That's, that's important. Like, you know, block out what's not important, block out what's just noise, right? But you've got to know your KPIs and you've got to know your KPIs for sales. You've got to know your KPIs for customer support and retention. You've got to know your KPIs for technology deliverables. You've got to know your KPIs for finance. And you've got to, and, and it's, and they're, and they are not set in stone. They evolve, right? They're always, they're always getting better. And so every single head of every division comes to that meeting and we go around the room. It's like clockwork. It's share, go over the numbers. What do the numbers look like this week from last week, this month from last month? What does it look like on a quarterly rolling average? Right. 
and we're always working on it. But so we're measuring everything, right? The other key thing is, and I, I think we should talk about how this relates to teams, is we're making the we're making these. I'm not doing these in one-on-one -on -one silos, convers, siloed conversations with the department heads. I'm doing it in front of everybody, so that everyone's numbers are visible to everybody else. And that's really key for accountability, right? Wait, so, let me ask them about accountability. Is that a hard Is that a hard thing? Like actually enforcing accountability? Like every week you're going around, people are reporting their numbers and like, you know, you want the KPIs to be here, but they're actually here. And after a couple of weeks, like, you know, having that conversation with that person off to the side, is it, I mean, how are you like, I, I think the fact that we make it visible, that's why I call it MAV. They all three work together. First off, you need to know what you're measuring and measure as much as possible. Secondly, it needs to be not just visible to you, right? It needs to be visible to everybody on the team, a 360 visibility. And guess what? That's actually what makes people accountable because who wants to come to that meeting every week and your numbers, you're the only one not hitting your numbers. Yeah. Everyone else is hitting your numbers. And if you miss your numbers, you're not, you're going to make sure that you don't miss your numbers again next week or next month. Right. Have you had to fire anybody for missing the numbers for, you know, one, two, three months. Um, so that's another principle, right? I surround myself with positive people. <laughs> I excise the negative. Um, I, I think that in terms of firing people, um, we clearly do fire people who don't perform over a long period of time, but we give them, we give them a lot of rope. Um, we try to coach them. We, we, um, we will set up regular meetings with them. We give them a lot of opportunity to improve their numbers. I do believe in giving people chances. Where I don't give people chances is when they're really, really disruptive people and negative people. So excising the negative is another one of the principles I wrote down this morning for you, Chris, which is what I've learned now with my gray hair, right? What I've learned is that it's for the most part, um, I would call it the 80-20 rule. For the most part, bad apples stay bad apples. Like you just, it's real. Now, 20% of the time, we've seen people who are so receptive to constructive criticism that, and I, you know what, I, let me say this. It's the people that are construct, that, that, are, that are receptive to constructive criticism, that's more about on performance. That's more on taking constructive criticism about maybe they're not a great listener or maybe they're, they're not, you know, documenting their numbers or whatever they're doing from a business standpoint. But people that are negative people, they don't change their stripes and you need to get rid of them. And you need to get rid of them fast. And when you get rid of them fast, you'll be surprised at the effect it has on your entire organization. So when it comes to firing people for performance, I really believe in letting people, um, you know, change. And occasionally we've had people unbelievably responsive to the constructive criticism and they have gone on to have terrific careers. But the people who stir the pot, who cause trouble in your organization, who, um, you know, fight with other people, you know, like you've got to get rid of them. Got it. I am, I'm taking a lot of notes. This has been good, man. I'm learning a lot. Hey, you got, you got a gray hair for every million dollars you made. So <laughs> I, I hope I have a head full of gray hair one day. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's good to, you know, it's good to, uh, look, I, I'm super humbled by, by being part of Ylopo and working. This is the best executive team I've ever worked with. Um, I've had some good, you know, good executive teams, but I love working this team. So this is the other thing we get back to, which is, you know, like what are my four, I have like this sort of quadrangle, these four boxes that, that for me kind of are critically important. And, you know, number one is that I've got to get up every morning and just be really excited about what we're doing. I've got to really love what we're doing or why the heck am I doing it, right? Life's short, okay? So you've got to get up every day and say, I'm passionate about this. I love this. I love what we're doing, right? And you've also got to love the people that you work with all the way around you, from your partners to your executive team to your employees. Now, how did the second box of that is I want the people I work with to be profoundly happy. You have to recognize that there's people you work with who are very ambitious, who really think of this as a career and a journey and a life, and they wanted to go on to great things. You have people like that. You also have to recognize that it's okay that some people you work with, it's not the live all and end all. They are doing this to make ends meet. They are doing this to pay their mortgage and pay their bills and all that kind of stuff. 
and they they have other things outside of work, right? They're musicians or you know they're athletes or whatever else they do, right? And that's what they drive, right? If that's okay, but but either camp that you work with, they need to be happy, right? So number one, I never create a work environment that I wouldn't want to work in myself. The environment is very important. It's environment that you've put people in, right? If you put people in, you know, cubicles, okay? Um, I, like to, I like to have offices with, which have floor to ceiling windows because I don't want to work in a cubicle myself, right? So, so those are the things that I, that, I, that I think about. So that's the second box. My people feel part of it. You know, more important than the environment is the mission, right? They've got to feel part of the mission, whether it's rallying them against the encroaching competition, right? You've got to rally them around, around yeah, something. You've got to feel that. part of it, right? Now, for them to feel part of it, um, and I would say this is probably my worst thing, as you can tell from this interview. Um, I'm not the world's greatest listener, but at, least, <laughs> <laughs> but at least I recognize it. That's critical, right? Know thyself, okay? So, so I think that from my first company through my second to my third, I think that I'm better. And you've got to get feedback. Like we have like a zillion Slack channels, as I'm sure you do. One of them is literally the suggestion box. And anyone can post in the suggestion box and they know that G and I and the rest of the executive team are going to see it. It's a 24 seven place where people can in a sense talk to us. You've got to have this, you know, I don't like, you know, an organization where it feels like it's this, I really like it to feel more egalitarian, you know, no matter where someone is in the organization, they can tell me anything. Like I want to hear it. Right. So you've got to be like, do you have an organization, you know, really critique yourself. Do you have an organization where everyone's heard? Do you have an organization where anyone can give you feedback, right? And what are you doing to solicit that feedback, right? We do something regularly called an all brains meeting. It's an all brains meeting, an all hands meeting. Bring your brains. I want to hear from you. I don't care where you are in the organization. I love that. So, so, um, so making sure the people you work with are really happy. Now your customers, right? You're my third box, right? I got to be happy. My customer, my, my, my associates would be happy. My customers have to be happy. So we've got our one level of success coming up. Um, I was truly, truly humbled when, you know, uh, uh, Jesse Zagorski, great client of mine in San Diego, texted me this weekend. He's like, he's like, dude, this is like the most awaited conference all year. He's like, every team leader wants to go. They can't wait. I was like, whoa, I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, I got to post this in my community, which I haven't posted yet. Like that hey, was, that was hey, really when's the um can just so everybody here knows yeah. that's on here when's the um upcming in, Lilo post in, summit? yeah it's in marina del rey um which is our backyard october 17th and 18th so we're three weeks i think and two days away or three weeks and a day away who, who uh, are some of the people you're most excited about having there that are going to share and you know talk yeah about? so um i'm really a hard critique of conferences i think there's like there's no industry that has more coaches and more conferences than the real estate industry it's absolutely amazing i would love to know maybe you know chris <laughs> the sheer number of coaches and conferences and masterminds oh, God. It, and, and i'm telling you it's very different than 2007 when i started tiger league right it's crazy number of online groups it's nuts right i i honestly don't know how some people get stuff done they're on facebook so much <laughs> yeah like how do they actually run their own business okay yep um so so look we've got probably the hottest coach in real estate right now john chaplak coming and he's coming for two Man, days. Love John Chiplick. Yep. So oh, John's going to be with us for two days. And John is going to be in his lane. He's going to be talking about, um, he's going to be talking about um, recruiting, right? Attracting great people to your team. Um, he's also going to be talking a lot about retention. How do you keep people once you have them, right? Um, he's also going to be talking a lot about productivity. How do you boost and maximize productivity? Um, our conference is made up both of team leaders as well as team members. So it's a, it's a tricky conference to pull off, right? Because we really need to speak to a broader audience. But one of my messages is like, we're all on the same team. I really, I really hate it when it's kind of like realtors who hate their tech vendors, you know, and say, oh, you're not providing me enough value or your leads suck or whatever it is, right? And then tech vendors who, who like don't like their clients who say, well, no, we don't suck, you suck, you, you're bad at lead follow-up and you've got bad systems on. And there's like this argument going on. I, I think it's silly, right? Because if my clients, you know, not everyone will be successful with every, with every system, right? I know that not everybody is going to be successful for whatever reason on our system, but by far the majority have to be successful. So, so my success, my company's success is completely wrapped up in my client's success. And that's like my third box, right? Which is my clients, when I run conferences and we show up, 
our clients run up to us and like hug us like we're family, which is so cool, you know, and, and we need to provide value, valuable service. You know, one of the great things back at Tiger Lead was we changed people's lives. I still have people who aren't even necessarily white love book clients. Some of them are, some of them aren't, who are just like, dude, we're forever indebted to you because of the stuff we learned along the way on the Tiger Lead journey that forever changed our business. No matter where they went and spent their money after that, it completely changed their journey, right? That's so, awesome. So that's like super, super important. Um, you know, G and Barry Jenkins are realtor in residence. Um, we've got a few realtor in residences. I want to grow the number of realtor in residence. We have white level professors. I'm wearing a white level professor shirt. So we also have clients who are nice. so good at using our system that we've dubbed them white level professors. And it says here on the back, I'm here to help. And they're going to be running around the conference, right? Nice. So, so it's, Great it's, idea. Learning, it's learning from our clients to build the best, badass, next stage technology. So all of these professors, like they're going to be on stage. They're going to be literally ripping open the covers and saying, here's exactly what we do with the y Lopo system. They'll be talking about things that are not necessarily related to the y Lopo system. But I mean, we're talking about everything. How to, you know, how to win more listings, how to get more sellers using our tools, um, what you need to do in the age of iBuyers. Um, we've got... You know, we've got some of the biggest teams literally in the world. We literally have the biggest Remax team in the world. We have the biggest team in the world. We've got um, the biggest, you know, expansion teams for KW. We've got the biggest AXP guys. You know, what's really cool is we work with all the brands, right, which is really nice. Um, so we are digging into all, all the details. And my biggest critique of a lot of conferences is that they're motivational and they're inspirational and they're rah-rah and you feel so good when you walk out. But. The next day, when you go back to work, the next Monday, you don't make a dollar more, okay? And that's my problem with most conferences. So I'm a really hard critic of not only other conferences, but our conference. I want to be in the weeds. I mean, look at how in the weeds, look at how in the weeds these boards are. Wow. Okay. okay. Oh my God. That's, I love all those weed boards. Yeah. That's how in the weeds we need to get. So like classroom style, laptops open like writing, 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 pearls of wisdom. We're like, there's a pearl, there's a pearl, there's a pearl. Like literally people will change their, I, I, I mean, I, like I'm overstating it. They will change their business lives by going to a two day summit because they don't know what they even have, right? They don't even know what they're not doing. And they're going to learn from, and, and the other thing is people that teach are also going to learn and people that are learning are also going to teach. So yep. look, I'm, I'm obviously like obsessed about it. You know, um, I think it's incredibly important from a psychological standpoint, um, from a cultural standpoint, and of course, from an educational standpoint. So I think we've got the right blend. There is some motivational stuff, there's some inspirational stuff, but a lot of it is like super hardcore, hardcore learning. So breaking, down, breaking down the ultimate conversation, breaking down literally, what do you do from nine to five? What do you do every single day? What's the best work plan? Processes, systems, scripts, dialogues. We leave no stone unturned. So October 16th and 17th, Marina Del Rey. 17th, 17th and 18th. 17th, Thursday, okay. Thursday and Friday. Yeah. 17th and 18th. Um, cool. And um, is there like a website people go to to check that out? How do you register? Uh, well, do you have to be a customer? Open, you know, it's not open to the public. Um, okay. It's only open to our own clients. Okay. So, you know, we have a we have a closed group, the Wild Success community. And so we, you know, we, we post it there. Um, Got uh, it. Any of our clients that are on the call that are not going, and we were technically sold out. Um, we, we, there's, there is, you know, with basically, um, we were, we, we wanted to close it off at 300. We now have 400 registrations. I cannot fit a single additional person in the room other than you, Chris, you need to come. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, man, I, I mean, need, I love Southern California. So What's that? I love Southern California. That's a great, we're going to have a kit. Well, I'm also a work hard, play hard guard. We're going to work hard, play hard guy. We're going to have a killer client appreciation party on the rooftop. Like we're gonna have the most amazing sunset overlooking all the boats and all of LA Thursday That's night. Awesome. Friday night we're doing some cool stuff. We're gonna do a whole pub crawl in Marina Del Rey in Venice and end up at a super cool speakeasy. Again, I think I'm I'm family. sold, man. Oh. I just wrote down. Go get. I'm gonna go tell my assistant about buy, buy, buy my ticket. Um. So okay. So what was the fourth? Uh, you were talking about the four. Um, the four squares, uh, you talk about the uh, last, lastly, you know, you, you've got to run a profitable business, right? I'm very old school. I'm very Warren Buffett when it comes down to real revenues, real profits. There are so many companies in our space, you know, is Redfin really profitable? Is Zillow profitable? Is eXp profitable? 
Is Compass really profitable? Like you can go on and on, right? Was Playster ever profitable, right? You know, raised $100 million. You can go on and on and on. I'm a little bit old school, right? Um, and I've seen guys become like, you know, people become immensely wealthy and ultimately never have a profitable company. And I, I just think it's wrong, <laughs> okay? So I'm a little bit old school. Um, I'm, I'm a know the numbers guy, right? I'm a watch the budgets guy. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, you know, I think that that's really critical. So my four boxes are, I've gotta be excited. The people I work with have to be excited. I've gotta deliver a valuable service or I don't wanna be in the business to my clients, right? Not selling them like a bill of goods. And ultimately, I've got to eventually build a profitable business. Now, now as a tech company, you're not profitable for a long time. You know, you could be burning easily six figures, as you know, you could be burning six figures a month. Yep. But you need to know when you're going to hit that inflection point where you can break even, tread water for a while, and then get and then get profitable. And then so um, and then some of those guys. And then earlier you mentioned about some of those uh, those principles you follow. The, the leverage, you talked a lot about emotional intelligence, um, hiring people better than yourself, specialization of roles, scaling into that as your business uh, evolves. You also mentioned um, knowing your numbers. Um, if you don't know your numbers, hire someone to help you with budgeting, uh, pro forma is, uh, you know, the financial model. So you have, you know, understand what everybody should be making in order to have a profitable business. You, you mentioned the 12 to 36 month um, forecast of, of what the business could look like. Um, talked about the MAV, uh, you know, measurable measurement accountability, accountability visibility. Yeah. Yep. And then I, also um, think, I, I think, I think that I, I, I use the analogy of being a blocker and an unblocker. Okay. So you remember the movie, the blind side, you know, okay. where, like, the most important position is the left tackle, right? Yeah. To protect the blind side of your quarterback. Yep. My job is to protect G and our executive team and our clients. My job is to, is to, and I think this, you have to write this down, right? You're always as a CEO, you always have to be looking around the corner. What does that mean, looking around a corner? Looking around a corner is trying to see things that not everyone can see, right? You can't technically see what's around a corner, right? But you need to try to look around the corner and be a blocker for things that can come at you in the future that can take your whole business down. So, so that's really, really important for me. And if I'm in the weeds on, if I'm not leveraging technology or leveraging other people, and I've got to be in the weeds every day and all these other things, right? I can't do what my job as a CEO is to do, which is to look around the corner and try to navigate the waters, right? In the right way, okay? So it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, the ability to try and use your past experience um, and research to predict the future. The, the other thing is to be an unblocker which is I really encourage my team to come to me to just brainstorm. What I find is, is that a lot of folks get blocked. A lot of your folks in your team get blocked. They have blockages, right? That prevent them from going to the next level, prevent them from producing more, but they can't get out of that block without some help, right? And it's kind of like a writer, you know, a writer who has a um, writing block. What do they go and get? I have a neighbor, he actually hired a muse. There was a movie called The Muse. It was a great movie with Albert Brooks, right? He went and hired a muse, which is the coolest thing in the world, right? And, and then she completely unblocked him and he wrote this like amazing book, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think that as a CEO, I would also advise reaching out, send the signal to everyone on your team that you are there for them, you're receptive, to help them brainstorm, for them to think about what's blocking them, what's the problem. And they will be convinced right? They will be convinced that there is an issue that they can't get around, but you brainstorm it with them. And when together you come up with a really creative solution, they're really thankful and they're going to come back to you again for, for some more help. So I think that that's, that's really, really important. That's a good little nugget. Cool. Um, so I guess to pivot the conversation a little bit to yep. something I am, uh, fascinated with which is lead generation lead quality lead conversion um talk to me about i mean you guys are spending a million dollars a month just on facebook i know you're going into uh, yeah, we're about 10 we're about 10 million a year annualized we're um, we're, we're not at a million yet a month we will be uh, yeah. very quickly but about 10 million a year which we think pretty much puts us at the top of the industry so what have you like man like the ahas the things you've discovered like what just, bleh, I want to hear it all. Okay. What have been your well, biggest ahas? Lead gen, lead quality, conversion rates, 
Right. Um, how do right. you s accelerate closings? Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, leads come in different flavors, right? They have different life cycles. <laughs> they have different costs, um, different expectations. And when someone says, oh, you know, Facebook is a source of bad leads or social media, it's a source of bad leads. They just don't know what they're talking about, right? It, those may be bad leads for them and how they and their team are wired. That's very possible. And I can explain that. But just as sort of, you know, write them off as bad leads is completely preposterous, right? So, you know, in the age of giant multi-billion dollar companies spending a crap load of money on direct-to-consumer marketing, right? We know who they are. Okay, are you going to compete with them? On those, you know, on, on that battleground, right? Are you going to compete with the 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 TV and radio and Google pay per click spend of Azilla? Like you're not, right? Um, so you know, what are you going to do? And you know, one of the things that that our clients do is they recognize that the social media leads are leads that we're pro. At, and and I hate the word leads. People have heard me say this before, but write down the word relationships. This could be a game changer if you profoundly think about the difference between calling someone, some person, someone who has a family, someone who has a history, someone who has to move for certain reasons, wants to buy or sell for certain reasons, to depersonalize them and dehumanize them and call them a lead does yourself a disservice. When you think about them as relationships, it's kind of a game changer because what we're doing- with paradigm with, shift. What's that? Yeah, it's a big paradigm shift. It's a big paradigm shift. Because you're not going to say, oh, I have 100 relationships sitting in the bucket I can't get a hold of. Right. When you say I've got 100 leads, it's like you can just toss them away and like, oh, I want yeah. the now leads. I want the close tomorrow leads, right? Yeah. If you think about them as relationships, you know, as a, as a team leader or as a realtor, as a broker, you need to ultimately build what I call terminal value in your business, right? What, what's your exit plan? What's your strategy, right? What are you going to build that actually has value? So then you don't have to work your own ass off in production every single day for the rest of your life, right? Yep. And one of the things you can do is build up over time an enormous database of relationships. And this is where we use technology. What do I, what do I say? Like, well, that was very complicated. Like, we have a huge technology set. And people are like, oh, my God, I don't even know how you explain well up to someone, like, in a 15-second elevator pitch. What I've come down to say is we've automated – you know, the relationship generation, I'm, I'm using that instead of leads, we've automated the relationship nurturing, providing the technology. So those leads, consumers, relationships keep coming back to the fishbowl of my clients versus going to Zillow or going to realtor.com or, or going, you know, open door or wherever else. Right. And you're using and, targeting ads to keep that top of mind awareness. That, that's right. right. Dynamic. And you guys automate it. So then we don't have to figure out how to go like set those up. You guys already know what works and they're just, they're just going. And, and you're right. It's not only is it automated, like it's automating, right, the, the generation of these relationships for my clients so they don't have to do it, okay? Um, you know, it's silly. I see companies who are saying, hey, we can teach you how to do this and teach you how to do this and give you this prop and give you this tool. But now this, like, team leader who's got a heck of a time trying to run a team and being a real estate, you know, person or a broker, they've got to go and become a digital marketer? That's yeah. crazy. This is what we yeah. do, for them, right? So automate that. Automate this nurture, as you talked about, the dynamic remarketing, so they're always coming back automatically, right? But, but it's, the word dynamic is really, really important. So, you know, people, they shift, they move. Like one day, the husband and wife is, is, is thinking about moving out to the suburbs, and then all of a sudden, they're like, you know what? Forget the suburbs. We want to go to the city center. Or, you know, somebody, you know, uh, they got a big bonus, and they said, you know what? We were looking at $300,000 homes, but now we can look at $500,000 homes. They're always shifting, Right. So, so by, you know, correct and proper nurture is dynamic. It's watching as their patterns are shifting, geography shifting, number of bedrooms and bathrooms are shifting, prices are shifting, dynamically getting in front of them with the right home at the right time is critically important, right? So, so automating that process, the nurture process, and now stage three where we are, which is I'm just over the moon with, which is also nurturing the relationship conversation proact being responsive when when we notice that there's elevated search behavior or elevated seller behavior we've got to be there tap you my client on the shoulder and say this person just did this send you a text alert and say reach out to them right now because they just did this right that's reactive we've been doing that 
but now we're proactive. Now we have created Raya Real Estate AI as your assistant. We've created an automated ISA who can reach out to the consumers and just every month, every once in a while, every few weeks, just tap them on the shoulder saying, blah, 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 right? Haven't heard from you or what's going on. And we think you might like these homes. We, we're seeing what they're searching for. We can literally text them and send them homes, right? As Chris Waters' assistant. And it's crazy. And for the first time um, next week in Miami, I'm speaking at the Real Talk. I'm, I'm, I've put some of these conversations to animated voice. It's really cool. No one's ever done it before. And we're going to show these conversations and people will be like, oh, that's a real ISA talking to them. I'm like, no, that's a, that's a bot. And that could happen concurrently 500 times, yeah. <laughs> right? Now, at some point, a real person, a real agent, a real ISA has got to stop, turn off Riot, right? Because we're still in the early stages. And it's absurd to think they're going to be perfect, right? Um, and, you know, and then take over the conversation, right? And I'm going to show some of those where the agent came in, watched the conversation. It was funny, like there'll be at dinner, like for half an hour, watch this conversation go on. Turn off Raya, come in, take up the conversation. I'll put it to a different voice and see where it goes. So it's automating the relationship generation, automating the relationship nurturing, automating the, re the, the, the relationship conversation, doing all this. This is the essence of the partnership. Now, you know, social media leads, Facebook, Instagram, all these leads, these people are far out. Like that's a blessing and it's a curse. It's a curse because agents don't really want leads. They want appointments, right? So if you don't have the proper nurture systems and the technology to keep an eye on these people and keep them close, keep them in your fishbowl and proactively create conversations, it's a problem. It's, it's just not worth your time, okay? Um, but if you want to build a really valuable database over time of relationships, you need to go fish right now upstream before they go down the Zillow waterfall, right? Go fish them upstream, get the relationship out of the river, out of the stream, put them in your nurture fishbowl, so that they, they're always seeing the right homes. They're always seeing the right message. They're always seeing the right communication. So they never go to these large multi-billion dollar portals, right? Keep them in yep. your ecosystem. Build it, build it, build it over time. Guess what? After six months, the average social media lead is getting closer. They're getting a lot closer. It could be six months, seven months, eight months. But if you've been investing in your business, like a real business, like I invested in my business, then guess what? In six months, every single month at that point, leads are getting six months old, right? Which means you now have down funnel downstream leads. So it's an investment in time. You cannot, if you have short patience, if you're ADD, if you're short patience, forget about social media leads, right? Now, the good thing about social media leads is they're very, very cost effective, okay? So you can build this really giant database for what it would cost you to just get a few leads from, let's say, the big portals. And the other thing is now the portals are absolutely moving towards getting into your pocketbook. They are reaching into your pockets. They want your commission splits. And there is nothing stopping them. Right now, it's 35%. There is nothing stopping them from 40%, 45%, 50%. There's nothing stopping them from kicking team leaders and brokers to the curb at some day, going straight to agents, right? What they have figured out, this will all be super controversial, what they have figured out, which they should, I'm, I'm not blaming them. They're doing the right business decision. What they figured out, right, is they figured out in reality how to become a brokerage without actually having to carry agents. It's pretty brilliant. None of the operations, none of the bricks and mortar, none of the legal headaches, none of the insurance headaches, and they figured out ultimately how to get a 50-50 commission split. Mark my words, it's where they're going. And then beyond that, they're gonna reward people who use their ancillary services. They're gonna reward people who use their mortgage, who use their title. Like there's a whole thing coming. Now I tell folks this, because I'm always trying to look around the corner and I'll tell them five or six years ahead, they don't listen and then it happens, right? So this is why I can, you, I can tell you that's coming down the pipe. It's happening. It's there's happening. no, you, right. You know, it's already right. happening. Yeah. So, so we're really excited also about now kind of what's interesting is we started Tiger with Google pay-per-click, right? We avoided that, that whole thing for the longest time here. While up, we wanted to be new and different and be on the cutting edge of social media lead generation. And while up has done three case studies on us, they want to do a fourth, which is just an honor. Um, but now we're going to go back. And for the first time, a little bit of a, of a reveal, um, Google's actually going to allow dynamic marketing um, on the on pay per click platform. Hey, some, something I, something I'll break down that I appreciate as a customer is so you guys have an integration for us uh, with the MLS, and so the actual ad copy reflects the status of the listing in the MLS, which is pretty cool. And something something that I used to have to do is I used to have to have a virtual assistant 
go in and like build the ad, put up the photos, pay that VA. Granted, I'm you know the VAs you know they work for like four or five bucks an hour, but like. You know, like that person, that VA not in this country, they don't. They must be yeah, offshore. Yeah, yeah. We we would outsource it, but still four to five dollars, right? And so you do that times all your listings, and then if you're, you know, if you're updating the listing every, you know, every time the status changes of the listing, you know, you would have a full time VA dedicated to doing that, and and that's what I had. And that VA, you know, I'm paying them nine hundred to a thousand dollars, which is cheap, but just to keep the Facebook ads updated for our listings. And so, um, you know, you, you kept, you keep saying the word dynamic and I guess just for people like layman's terms, like some of the examples of the dynamic are, you know, like the, the ad copy itself is updated real time. You don't have to go in there and edit it. And it's all based off what it's all based off like what, what you change in the MLS. And, and, and so I was able to eliminate the VA completely with the YLOPO. And now our listing manager, she logs into YLOPO, hits a, a green play button. <laughs> <laughs> and it and it automatically, you automatically pull the listing. We can run yeah. listing, open ads. Oh we man, run, it's, we can it's run, you know, yeah, open house ads. That as soon as you've let you know register an open house, we run open house ads. We can run you know uh, coming onto the market ads. We can run thirty days in the market ads. We can run pending ads, all that. And then we're going to be releasing Diva dynamic video ads engine, which no one's released, where you can <laughs> produce hundreds, if not thousands, of videos at the touch of a button, oh, all around game changer. Your listing, it's a game changer, right? And again, this is not me, right? This is G, okay, right? And our, and our CTO, who no one even knows, Chris, right? My partners are the best, right? But it's, it's, always, it's always like forward thinking, right? To finish out the lead thing, right? People need to think about not the sort of cost per lead. Think about their, their cost per close. Think about their return on investment. Those are the metrics to think about. Don't think about close rates, because your close rates in Austin are different than your close rates in Beverly Hills, which are different than your close rates in Birmingham, Alabama. Think about your return on internet marketing, right? Or just your client acquisition costs. That's what I like. Your to client at. acquisition yeah. costs, right? And and so you know you know people might like a portal lead because it's really they they think it's like really down funnel and short term, but it's so extra extravagantly expensive. Your CAC right? is like three four it's times crazy, Google or Facebook. Right? Three, four times. And you're not building up this giant, valuable database of relationships that someday, if you have a system in place and a giant database of relationships that you've been building for years, that's now like people have to understand is your most valuable leave someone, someone that came in eight days ago or someone that came in eight years ago? And I would argue it's eight years ago, right? Because those people are ready to buy and sell again. They're or totally bought ago. into you. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, 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 so now we've built technology for the first time where we can keep them close to our clients forever and think about that, right? And constantly reaching out to them, keeping tabs on them where you don't physically have to do it yourselves, okay? So that's what we think about. What I really am fascinated about is this next level of Google marketing um, where there is more search intent. I think Google marketing sits between kind of the portal lead and the social media lead, right? So I think from a time frame standpoint, this portal lead is super expensive. They've got your hands in your pockets, commission splits. Um, they're really, really downstream, but good luck closing one. Then on the other side, you've got your social media leads, build up a huge database in six months, seven months, eight months, nine months. They're constantly going to be like business for you, buyers and sellers. In the middle is going to be Google pay-per-click where there's search intent. They're in between that life cycle, right? In certain markets, they can be crazy expensive, San Francisco, San Diego. Um, they can just be crazy expensive because there's so much bidding, right? In other markets, we're finding we can actually get that cost down to roughly where social media leads are, which is a game changer, right? Now, again, no leads, I always said this, right? No leads are created equally, okay? Your social media leads will have the, the highest rate of valid contact information compared to your Google pay-per-click leads because they're pulling directly from Facebook. And the consumer originally put in valid contact information, okay? In the world of Google pay-per-click, a much higher rate of invalid emails, phone numbers, because people know that game, right? Just fill out some crap, get to search for homes, right? So, so your rates are a little bit, they're, they're not great there for Google, okay? But what we have found is much higher intent to buy in a shorter period of time, which more than makes up for the loss you have on some bad information. Now, if you also have technology over time that can help you find this person, verify them, bring in their contact information, mm -hmm. that's a game changer. And yeah. that's what we're working on. I love that. I'm really excited about the video stuff y'all are doing. And I think you do bring up an interesting point. Like, you know, like for us, we found, you know, if you look at the short term, uh, short term conversion rates, Facebook are going to be lower 
Um, you know, and then Google is a little bit better. And then the third party portal leads, the conversion rates are pretty high. Um, you know, something else that, um, uh, you know, uh, Zillow has done for us in Austin is they now are scrubbing the leads for you. And we are finding really high double digit conversion rates for those, which has been awesome. Yeah. But again, the, the challenge then becomes your budget, right? Like you can, you know, you have to spend a, spend a, um, you know, a lot of money, which is fine if, as long as you manage client acquisition costs. So I think for anybody watching this, it's just, it's important for you to, you know, be uh, mindful of what your budget is. And, to, you know, to your point, I think something you guys do really cool um, is you can help someone build their, their database really, really big. And then let's say they are spending money on leads through Zillow, um, realtor.com, any of these portals, whatever, you know, you can put them into YLOPO and you guys can be the marketing engine to maintain top of mind awareness. Also, somebody could potentially leverage the AI um, bot that you guys have integrated oh, to help we improve have clients, we, we have tons of clients that buy Zillow leads or realtor.com leads. The combination of realtor.com leads or Zillow leads plus all of our nurture and our proactive conversation technology, the AI stuff, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're taking their ROI on the portal leads, Zillow and Realtor.com leads, and they're sending them through the roof, right? That's, that's, that's really, really critical. But Chris, you reminded me of a really, another critical point I wanted to bring up, which is diversification. Yep. And this is another guiding principle for me, as important as measurement, accountability, visibility, which is never putting, as a business owner, all of your eggs in one basket. Those people who put all of their eggs in the Wailopo basket or put all of their eggs in the Zillow basket, right? That is just a bad business decision. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things I do is, is, you know, first off, you just look at your risk. You have to do a risk analysis. Do you have everything locked up in one critical employee with no backfill? What happens if that employee does get sick or if they leave you? What are you going to do? How are you going to diversify yourself out of that key employee risk? But beyond that, and I've learned this lesson, by the way, the hard way, what happens if you have a client or a customer that's like 75%, this is not really relevant for team leaders, right? But, but if you have a client that represents, if you're doing enterprise sales or something, if you have a client that represents 75% of your revenues, that's really a bad position to be in, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but also if you have a relationship source or a lead source, and you're relying 100% on Realtor.com or Zillow or 90% on Realtor.com or Zillow, right? You're all in with these guys. You need to be very, very careful because you cannot count on that relationship forever. God bless you. I hope that, it's, that it, it is forever. I hope that they're great for you for 10 years or 20 years. But you cannot, you've got to diversify out of that. You've got to play out the scenario. Again, looking around the corner, play out the scenario. What if? They change the rules on me again. What happens if they drastically change the price? What happens if they, they drastically change the commission splits? What happens if something I don't even know about happens, okay? I've seen teams literally crumble and implode because they had all their eggs in one basket. The rules of the road changed and they weren't wired for it. Mm. So that's really critical. This is a very tough thing. People like to like put their head in the ground, avoid it. This is a tough one to avoid. So when it comes to clients, customers, vendors, suppliers, technology providers, you know, employees, you've got to look at all of that. Like, do, does my company rely, you know, 100% on one piece of technology? If it does, I'm sure shit going to build it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Because if they get acquired or something happens to them, I'm shit out of luck and I'm not going to be shit out of luck. Yeah. I love that. Well, hey, um, Howard, we've we've gone way over in an hour, and I could we could probably keep this going because I have a lot more questions about like optimizing conversion cycles. But for the sake of time, um, you have a, an amazing group of people at um, YLOPO. If people are, are watching this, want to learn more about YLOPO, you get the YLOPO professors. Um, you know that the, the uh, you know I don't know how much G gets involved in working with customers now because he's super busy on the yeah, yeah, on yeah. the on the development side, but. Um, yeah, anybody watching he's this, you know, about I, blocking and unblocking, and 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 he came to me one day and said he's on, he's been on the phone six hours every day with VIP clients like yourself. Yeah, and I'm like, is that his lane? Yeah, or is he's lane working on Diva and dynamic marketing for Google and you know all the next generation stuff. He needs to be working on digital marketing and product. Again, I've got to brainstorm with him. How do I unblock him? And that's yep. where our realtors and residents and our professors come in. Yep. Cool. Um, Howard, thank you so much for being on. I'm super, I'm super glad you got to be on here. Um, I'll see you on October 17th and 18th in Marina del Rey. 
Um, I took I took a ton of notes. I two, took two pages of notes here. I'm honored, man. Um, so I'm those were me on. I'm honored you took notes. Yeah, those those were some great notes on just you know uh, some great nuggets or pearls as you call them to um, help everybody level up as a CEO and entrepreneur, try to take their team business to the next level. And um, you know I'm a uh, I'm a big fan of Y Lopo. Super excited about what you guys are doing. Um, you know I, I I think of Y Lopo as kind of like it, it's almost like a, a you know, it, it kind of replaced a marketing person on my team, sort of, you know, cause like they don't, I don't have to go hire somebody that's like a savant at Facebook marketing. They can leverage, you know, uh, um, Lopo and literally just hit a play button to get a listing to go live or to generate buyer leads or seller leads and get, you know, retarget or, you know, the retargeting stuff happens automatically. Like it's, it's like, I don't know y'all, you could not have made it any more simple. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm sure that was the intent, but like it's, if you're technically challenged, you will figure out how to use Y Lopo. It is that easy. We are, we are listening to you guys and we're trying to automate things. We're trying to get you to, you know, eliminate some expenses, people expenses. People don't have to hire real. They do not have to hire super expensive ISAs. We've got people cut down on the number of ISAs. That's what we're trying to do. It's a partnership. Yeah, man, I love the um, the AI part. The the conversations, you know, like I was used to having these drip text message SMS texting features. I was used to that, and like I thought when you guys rolled this out, I thought it was gonna be like that. But then I started following these conversations. I'm like, holy Crazy, shit, man. that sounds like Crazy. a real person talking to him. I was like, oh my god. And then you know, it just it helps enhance lead engagement, so you know what leads to actually, you know, what relationships you should be maintaining and trying to convert. You yeah. like that relationship said it. Yeah, exactly. And I promise you we're at the very, very beginning of AI. Um, we're really at the very beginning. It's going to get a lot better. So it's pretty cool. Exciting. Well, Howard, thanks again for being on for those of you guys watching on the uh, Facebook group. Um, I'll try to get to your comment section. I'm sorry. I haven't been watching it. We've had quite a few people on the, um, on the live uh, piece. I've been, I've been feverishly taking notes here. Um, and um, every, every, every time I get a chance to get a, you know, spend any time with you, Howard, I always walk away, at, you know, uh, substantially smarter. So well, coming, um, thank coming from you, man, that's that's like that's going to put me in a good mood for the rest of the month. <laughs> well, th thank you, Howard. Um, I'll, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And um, uh, for those of you guys watching, you guys can check this out on iTunes. We'll have it up on YouTube soon. And uh, if you're not a member of our private Facebook group, it's an invitation only group. You've got to have a team. It's got to be at a certain size. But um, send me an email or reach out to us. Just go to... Um, uh, let's see, go to Chris, chriswatershq.com. Um, we've got some of our resources on there, like the, uh, the book, the million dollar real estate team, which a lot of you guys, uh, have, um, I think most, a lot of people in this group have, have purchased, but, um, we're giving the book away for free. So anybody watching, you guys can go check out the book. You guys get a copy of it, but, um, Howard, thanks again. Thanks, and, man. um, yeah, look, look forward to connecting in a couple weeks. Cool. See ya. Bye. Thank you.